Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Sup, in y'all? Kerrang HQ in London. Uh, thanks everyone that's uh, made the journey into London today. Thanks, uh, hello to everyone that's joined us on Facebook. Uh, I'm Sam Court, I'm the editor of Kerrang. You're joining us for In Conversation with Mr. Winston McCall. Round of applause. Hi, round of applause. I wasn't anticipating applause. I wasn't anticipating applause for this stuff. So roll out it's the really best. nice. But yeah, it's <laughs> thank you. It's a nice welcome. Uh, Winston, you've once again, we were just talking, been dispatched around the world to talk up your band's Shot me latest off from the cannon. <laughs> from the um, cannon we have in Australia to dispatch <laughs> people overseas. There's a big line. They load you into the cannon and shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a nice way of travelling the flight, but sure. Um, we are here tonight because this Wednesday, January 22nd, uh, Viva the Underdogs is going to be in cinemas for one night only. Yeah. Um, it's a great film. It charts your the kind of reverence tour era, building up to mm. your headline set at Varken. Yeah. I kind of want to talk um, about kind of the first two thirds of the film Go uh, for it. in this, the, you know, the kind of the journey, the documentary yeah. part more than anything. Um, but before we jump into that, I guess kind of let's start at the very beginning. Where did the idea for this film come from and why was it important for you to document this chapter in the band's career? It's a really weird one because it kind of just came about from not having documented anything. Like, has anyone here um, seen the other movies that we made or anything like that? Yeah, so we always documented things and... We'd put out two before, and this was the largest period of time between not putting something out. And it was also the period of time where a lot of weird things have happened, um, and a lot of development has happened within the band and within us as people. Um, and it got to the point where we were like, why have we not released something? This is quite interesting. <laughs> just, there's, there's, a lot, like, there's a lot of change has happened in the years since people last saw us, basically. Um, but we didn't really know what to make in the sense of like, what is the story here? The first one was literally, this is who we are, introduction to the world. We're a bunch of weirdos that play loud music and jump off stuff and act like idiots. Number two, we're doing that, but around the world. Like, um, but that's not like, that's not where we're at now. And we're different people doing different things, but the vehicle is still the same and we wanted to catch people up because, man, it's still interesting. It's just a different thing. I think it's really interesting that the, the, the film kind of captures you and the rest of the guys trying to sort of figure out a period where you've, yeah. you know, you're coming into these size venues, these festival slots, and we kind of get to go on the journey with you as you kind of discover how... How to, to do, do it. those things. <laughs> yeah, how to do it, basically. There's a, there's a bit, uh, I think it's during your first kind of production rehearsal where you say that it's kind of the first chance that you get to see the ideas that start on little scraps of paper mm. come to reality. Who in the band is the kind of driving force behind those things or is it very much a collaborative? No, it's, it's myself and Luke in terms of the, the visuals. Um, the creative crew is... Myself, Luke, Fishy, um, Steve, our lighting designer, um, and then Manny, who um, is our head of pyro, who owns the pyro company. And between us, we basically it'll start with generally a concept that I have in terms of a base concept of how the staging is, like what I see for the staging and moments to do with songs and things we want to emphasise in certain ways. And from there, that gets pitched towards the group and we start building stuff around those concepts and that all works within the framework of dimensions and basically how big is the stage? <laughs> how big is the stage? How big is the room? What can you put in it and what effect do you want to create with the songs and how? what effect do you want the entire set and this era to represent for the impact and how you want the songs to be interpreted and that's kind of where it starts. Are those concepts coming to you as you are writing and recording the music? You know, are you, are you yeah. kind of seeing things visually as 100%. you are writing 100%. the music? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, for us, we've always been, the live came before the recorded. We've always been a live band. Um, the recording part came afterwards and it's 
just as important it's just a different a different aspect but um when we came to recording we were always recording and trying to capture something live um now that that is obviously recording is it allows for a completely different expression but when you go into the studio um it's i mean music is an an evocative thing like and it it stimulates your senses like in a very all-encompassing way, even though it is just sonics. And when you rock up to a live gig, you're not just listening, you're experiencing it. So that's what, like, when you are creating in the studio, that is something that you take into take into account. And for us, it's gone, especially to me, it's gone beyond wanting to express that in sheer just, like, chaos, like, make people go skits. <laughs> um, I, I, I very much enjoy doing that, but there's other elements of myself which I want to illustrate to people through the lyrics or whatever, which is not just ne- necessarily chaos. And the ebb and flow that you feel through the music I want to be represented through the actual visuals. Have you ever come up with an idea and then sat down with the guys and gone, I've got this great idea, guys, and everyone has looked at you like you are clinically insane? <laughs> <laughs> um, that we have had to dial things back. But um, the idea has always been do a little bit more than you're supposed to. Like, risk it. <laughs> like put that spinning wheel in that room that can't quite fit it and then set it on fire. <laughs> like that, that, that's kind of been the mentality that we've always had. But um, so far it hasn't reached a point where it's been too... You've, the bits where it, people have gone, yes, that's insane and we've all run out of the production hall because that's literally going to kill us had never made it onto stage so <laughs> um yeah we're still pretty we're still growing into the process that's the thing like it, even when people think of this band now and go whoa the production is crazy and what you see on stage is crazy it's literally been within the space of two record cycles that's not a massively established thing for us and this is something considering we handle all of that ourselves it's something we're growing into a lot we're still like the imagination is several steps in front of what you see these days. <laughs> um, you talk in the film, I think it's quite early on, um, <clears throat> about how this, the arena run that kind of opens mm. up the reverence era and preceded the kind of festival headlining slots was about kind of proving that you'd earned those festival mm. slots that were coming up. Where does that mentality come from with you guys that you feel a need to, to prove, prove something that... Because I just everyone's feel, been shouting for. Because I always feel like that for all the people that are shouting for us, like there is always been people that have seen us as having reached a potential, having been doing a, like doing what we do in an area where we're not supposed to be doing it, being from a place which is not expected to create what we're creating, playing a type of music which is not meant to have the shelf life that it has had, um, not looking the right way, like not knowing the right people, all of those kind of things has always played into it. Um, so I've always kind of just had a chip on my shoulder in that regard. But at the same point in time, what we have had behind us, which has always had our backs and always given us the confidence, is the fact that you can't argue with personal connection and when you break it all down the only reason we are where we are is because we haven't been ashamed to do what we do and that has connected with so many people like the people coming to shows is the purest representation of what this band stands for it's as simple as that like you can't fake human connection of the amount of people that come to a gig and that's not something that's happened from anything other than the desire to prove that we belong there and that anyone that comes to our shows belongs here as well. And that's kind of it. If other people have doubted you at times, have you ever, have you guys ever doubted yourself that you would have oh, yeah. reached that point? Yeah, 100%. It was never... Up until about... Uh, been within three to five years, it really was... We, like, we bought into that concept of, like, 
this is the best it will ever be. Wow, can't believe we're here. Don't know how we got here. Just damn lucky. And that was it. And as much as there is, yeah, you are lucky to do what you do. We are very, very um, aware of how privileged we are to be in this situation. But that does not mean that we have not spent thousands of hours committed to the craft that we have and that what we what we do is something that literally dominates our lives and our mentality like there's no there isn't something else in our mind that this is playing off against like we live everything about this band and have done for almost half our lives um and when you dedicate that much time um you you get good at that thing and that thing happens to be something which is continuing to connect with people that we now have faith in that continuing on and that being worth something but there was a very long time when we we're just like yeah this is like this has got to be just a hell of a lot of luck and that's it but if you give it all to luck then you kind of do yourself a big disservice and you do a disservice to the people who make a connection based on something that they see is pure and not just based on luck in the i think it's quite interesting that you <clears throat> you sort of mentioned the you know other people maybe kind of being vocal in in doubting you guys mm. um you know the your head headline appearance at bloodstock last year features in the film um and you know i, I remember when that was announced there was some conversation from you know some of those kind of bloodstock purists conversation to... <laughs> <laughs> it's a polite way of putting it <laughs> wow you're kind you know as to, as to whether you guys dialogue could do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you do you feel that following last summer the conversation has changed around your band i have no idea to be honest because i don't really pay that much attention to it um, i think perceptions do shift well, I, I know they do simply because it keeps going forwards. That's the thing. Um, if you simply look at the trajectory this band has had, um, it would seem to be that people go to a show and then simply by numbers, the next time they come back, they're bringing at least another friend with them because there's twice as many people. So you can't really argue with that, that's the thing. And whether or not the conversation has changed as to where we belong, who we are, what our identity is, what people's perception of Parkway Drive and what the name sounds like and what the music sounds like is is reasonably, like I'm not gonna look down on someone or judge someone for their opinion on anything, to be honest, because it's music, it's all subjective. Like. A, if you don't like what we do, that's cool. There's plenty of things I don't like. Like, <laughs> you don't you don't have to like it, and that's fine. But if someone's gonna book us on a festival or give us a slot because they wish to achieve something with what they are doing as well, then I'm more than happy to like stand up and go, "Yo, if you think we fit there? We'll do it, and we'll give you 100 percent." And I'm not ashamed of who I am and what I do. <laughs> Um, the film, uh, it's obviously entirely sort of focused on the Reverence era, but it, mm. it contains some amazing old footage yeah. of you guys touring. And all sorts, of, <laughs> all sorts of messing around and surfing and yep. kind of jackass-style stunts. Yep. And a ridiculous amount of nudity for, for <laughs> oh, a film. You thought that? Um, that you th man, you should have seen the un <laughs> unedited version, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking back on those days, what did you love most about touring? Um... everything like everything about it and I still love the same things like it's we have seen the world um, through this band like uh, a little bit of a background if anyone doesn't know where we come from and when we came from there um, when we started this band our town had the highest unemployment rate in our country um, I was flipping burgers at a cafe Two of us were washing dishes. One was working in the video store. One was literally watering wheatgrass for a juice company. <laughs> and those were the, the best jobs that we could get in our town. And we were never looking for anything else. So when someone, when you get to play music and 
be given the chance to go to these places you've never been in your entire life and see some stuff like that seems like the most amazing thing like the most amazing opportunity you could ever have like why would you say no to that you've got nothing going on back where you were so that was literally what just drove touring for us it was like oh my god i've never gone there before i'll go there cool oh my god we're, we're gigging at the same time sweet and that was just a like that took us around the world literally took us around the world i don't know how many countries we've played now but it's it's like 70 something countries or something other than africa and antarctica like when i look at the globe on the side of my bed i can picture what so much of this planet looks like from actually seeing it it's mind-boggling that music has given me that and that's the best thing about touring and so many different places to take your clothes off in, so many apparently. yeah <laughs> So um, many. <laughs> why? Why do you guys enjoy taking your clothes off? It's so mainly much? Jaya. <laughs> it was. Always, I don't know. Well, you know what? It was. We had this thing with Jaya early on where um, he was the guy that you could just pressure into doing something stupid, <laughs> or, or getting naked, or just doing. It generally involved him getting naked for some reason, and when he was our merch guy, especially, we just like you're doing merch do this dumb thing to entertain us and he'd go and do it and then when he was in the band it's like you're the new guy in the band do the dumb thing entertain us <laughs> always involved him being naked what's but, yeah. the dumbest thing you ever got him to do oh uh, the pissing, on the, the pissing on the electric fence was pretty heavy and i think that's in the movie isn't it that's, that was i couldn't believe he was thinking like I'm like what do you think was gonna happen then so, oh my god it almost killed me <laughs> like a horse kicked me in the dick You're like yeah dude it's electricity <laughs> like come on what did you think was gonna happen <laughs> so yeah probably that one just because it's nasty <laughs> I'm sure there's far worse to be honest but yeah <laughs> um it's spoke earlier about the kind of the the connection with the fans and how that's the kind of the, the driving force mm. of the thing um on stage, I guess that connection with people um, when you're playing small rooms is, is very easy. You know, mm. they're this close to you. So <laughs> at those festivals and those huge arenas, you know, you, you're quite disconnected from yep. the audience. How have you had to adapt as a front man to kind of maintain that connection with people? Um, it goes between the direct connection of literally m trying to make eye contact with people and engaging with people because distance is distance but I can I can still see someone's face it gets a little harder when someone's hundreds of meters away but I'm still very aware of the fact that people are singing to me people are looking at me like and it makes me smile like it's a, I, I have a human reaction to that and the other the other way is like performance wise it's more abstract in the sense of what we're actually what I'm actually doing and what the music is embodying on stage but giving the most true representation um, physically and visually of what the music actually means to me in the hope that that will help connect the meaning and the emotion behind the song. Um, it's not the same thing as communicating in the sense of literally going, I see you there, you having a good time, sick, which I do plenty of as well. But um, it's the, it's, the thing which I think make mu makes music special in the first place. I've found that there's so many times when I've watched artists s performing on stage and it's been, it hits and strikes a chord with me in a way that no language can. It says something which we cannot communicate and which has not been able to be communicated with me in any other way other than what I am experiencing at that point in time. And it's not necessarily just a, smile and a wave and a, I'm jumping on your head crowd surfing so who are yeah. those who are those artists for you who are those uh, for me the number one's Nick Cave like s straight up it's um it's, it's very stunning to to feel impacted in that way um lyrically the, the thing that was, has always struck me with his performance has been I find his lyrics to be absolutely incredible um but incredibly descriptive and cryptic at the same time um, to use that concept of language and performance to 
in such an emotionally resonant way that I really find myself like feeling things which you 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 can't feel in, in like there's no word to des- to des- to describe it within the language that I have. So yeah, that's what I am to live up to is being able to be someone that can kind of do something like that. Um, we took some questions from our audience here yeah. uh, prior to prior to starting. Um, do we have Francesca Harrison in the room? Hey. Hey, go on. Um, Francesca wanted to know what you've um, discovered about yourself over the years on your journey with Parkway. I'll step in and I'll talk to you. <laughs> yeah. What have I discovered? Um, that is a very massive question because of the amount of time that we've been doing this. Uh, that was actually one of the things that I find really evident in the movie, seeing like the really old footage. I'm just like, man, we were really, really young when we started this. Um, even at the age of like 21, we thought we knew everything. And then when you travel the planet um, and you are put in situations where you have to learn how to survive but at the same point in time you're given the opportunity to do what we do it literally defines who you are like i it's a it's such a like it's a very very deep question to be able to even mine for truth to be honest um i think i like the person that i would be without parkway would be completely different because it's afforded me the chance to um, truly focus on that discovery and then being able to put that discovery in an environment that is testing but at the same time uh, open to such interpretation of who I am as a person and creatively like that's a very big part of me like I this is it's allowed it to come out in me and be that person on stage and in like collaborate with people who only heighten that aspect of my personality. So that's a very random answer, but it's a very, it's, yeah, it's a very good question. So I hope that gives you a little bit of, little bit of insight for it. <laughs> um, we'll return to some more solid ground and come back to some more of the guys' questions okay. uh, in a bit. Um, I think the film gives, it gives a really good behind the scenes look for anyone that uh, has never been backstage or has never seen mm. what goes into putting on a huge show. Was it nice for you guys to sort of be able to, you know, give a bit of the spotlight to the guys that worked so yeah. hard for you? Yeah, 100%, 100%, because that's been one of the really shocking things about being in this band that we are still shocked by. Um, this whole experience I remember playing like our first show like it was yesterday. So when you're stood on stage with these five guys um, who remember just that, just standing on stage and playing, but now there are literally 50 incredibly talented humans working to create this show that like that you've designed on stage and you like I do not have the skills to be able to do what they do um we do just stand there and just go what the fuck is going on how did it get to this like how how is this is this possible it really is like being able to like just tap into your imagination and let it flow out onto a stage and have these people execute like your wildest dreams and they work their ass off for every like people think we work hard as a band uh, uh, we do but in terms of what the road crew do we literally rock like rock up at 8 in the morning they work their ass off the entire day right up until showtime. we play they work to make the show work we get off and go and get food to eat and they work to pack it down for like another 4 hours go to bed for 6 hours hop in the bus drive and do it the next night and that's their tour and it's just hours and hours of very skilled labor to make sure that entire thing is put together so we can go up there and play with it for a couple of hours. So, yeah, I'm, I, I, I was wondering if people would find it interesting and I hope that they would because it's, um, it's pretty wild. It's a wild thing to put together. Uh, I mean, your tour manager, Oisey, 
Oasis. <laughs> You'll see, oh, when, you're going to learn guys, who Oisey is. When you guys see the film, <laughs> you will get to know Oisey. Um, talk to me about him. He's like, you could make an entire <laughs> film about Oisey. Oh, that, that, yeah, that's what our director said as well. He's like, my God, I could make an entire series on that guy. Um, Oisey is our tour manager. He is from Bavaria in Germany. He's hilarious. Uh, and I, where do I even start? What's your impression? What's your impressions of him from this? Um, an amazing TM, absolutely hilarious. But I love how he manages to switch from being super hilarious one minute to then literally slapping you guys down at any given second yeah. when you need it. <laughs> yeah. So the thing with Oisey was. Um, we met him years ago on, I think it was, it was a Never Say Die tour that we did a long time ago. And he tour managed the entire tour. And he came on our bus um, to oversee everything. And we are kind of notoriously just dickheads to each other. Like the Australian way is just be a jerk to your mates so no one gets a too big or ego and everyone basically is happy being semi-miserable with themselves. <laughs> like, yeah, so that's kind, of, that's kind of the thing. Um, so anyone that rode on our bus, like it's full trial by fire, like semi-bullying bullshit, um, which we've since got ourselves out of. It was only ever within like the parkway circle. Um, but anyone that like came into that circle copped it and they had to like deal with it until they were used to it and always he came on and someone i can't even remember how it started piped up immediately and he just came straight back and roasted them into the ground and we we're like oh shit this guy <laughs> this guy can hang all right this is going to be interesting and he has since told us that we were like, what did you think the first time you came on the bus? And he was like, yep, I came on here and I, one of you guys said something to me. And I was like, right, this is how it's going to be. It's like the prison fight. You find the biggest guy and you take them down and that's it. <laughs> and and Oisey set that up very, very early on. And ever since then, it was just like, you just don't, like, he will have the last laugh. And he's a very intelligent human and he's got a wicked sense of humor. Like, he's absolutely hilarious. But he's a really, 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 really good TM. Like, really good. And we're lucky to have him. Like, we're lucky to have our whole team, but he's, he's like, pulled through. <laughs> he actually, he says something really interesting in the film as well, which is that as a band, you guys are always kind of one step ahead of yourself. <laughs> but sometimes your kind of operation is one step behind because, yep. you know, the other thing that's really interesting in this film is that how much of it you do yourselves. Yep. Do you consider that kind of... DIY approach to, th to many of your things, a, a strength or a weakness or a bit of both? Bit of both. Um, mainly strength, to be honest. Like, it's, it's choosing not to compromise. So I guess everyone's going to find it out and see it if they see this movie. But yeah, we do. Everything we can do within the band, we do it ourselves. Like the band is self-managed, self-written, self-created, like the staging you see on stage comes from us. Like everything that we can do, we do. And then we get people we trust to execute things. Like I don't have a pyro license, so I'm not gonna go out, I can't go out and learn that shit, but I will learn how, like what will work in what situation and I will trust the professionals that we trust. Um, because we do, we do that because we, basically have faith in what our vision actually is for all of these things. And not only that, but we've found that if you don't do it in this day and age, you will have to get someone else to do something. And that costs a shit ton of money. Like if you want to survive in this world as a, as a touring band, just as a band full stop, like every single thing sent counts and the strength of, like the strength and the weakness side of things is if you don't have the strength to step up into that role, someone, you're gonna have to pay someone to do that because you can't just 
have this operation continue to expand exponentially and roles not be filled. So though that's the thing where we're like, okay, Luke, you're the manager. Like Winston, you're going to do all of the press and you're going to design these things. Like whatever we've had interest in, we've stepped into those roles and done it. And it comes down to like, I, th I think it's a strength for us because we take pride in those and put effort into those areas and they're, they're areas of genuine interest as well but at the same point in time it's a like you got to be ready for a lot of work and that can be really really taxing so yeah it's not so much a weakness in the sense of us being bad at it because i think we're pretty good at it but it's a weakness in the sense of you just got to be like you, you got to really know what you're capable of doing and you got to commit to it because the stakes are high and the bigger you get the higher the stakes get that's the thing there's never been a point in time where you're like i've made it now i can relax it's just been like you've made it and 10 problems is now 100 problems so yeah <laughs> um you mentioned the pyro license um yeah one of the kind of symbolic moments of the movie i mean it's on the movie poster hmm. It comes up a few times throughout the film. Is Me throwing a bomb around on stage. Is you throwing a <laughs> Molotov cocktail <laughs> yeah. on stage. Um, do we have Celia in our audience? Um, Celia wanted to know how, how you feel in that moment when you are stood with... With a Molotov, a in, Molotov your in your hand. All right. To, st to start with, it's not going to blow up. It is, there's a degree of like control to it, so I feel good about that. Um, it's nerve-wracking because it doesn't always work. Um, which again, you will see when things go wrong. Um, it's a very, it's an interesting thing. It's a really naked moment of performance in the sense of it's literally me on stage and I'm not screaming into a microphone and there's no music or anything like that. It's, that was the first piece that we had where when we rehearsed it, we were like, this is literally just performance art. There's nothing to do with our music right here. It's about what that moment represents. And when we were designing this show, we went through a number of things where we were like, we want to smash that logo. And we want that to like, it's literally representing like setting the whole thing on fire and smashing these preconceptions of what that actually is. Um, and trying to figure out how to do that. It went from, okay, we could set it off with pyro jets or you could get a flamethrower to do that. And every time we had something, we are like, it kind of defeats that that raw element of that moment which is that spirit of rebellion like that underdog mentality which we had and luke had the idea of like just chuck a molotov at it because that's what that that has always represented the molotov cocktail has been that and we're like sweet um but for me going out and doing it that is what that section of the show embodies for me but at the same point in time i'm like hoping that lighter works and I'm hoping that there's fuel on that fuse and I'm hoping the whole thing doesn't like it, it can't explode but it can still like it's gone off on my hand a couple of times like not like boom but the glass has just gone and then I hope that I my aim is decent <laughs> uh, especially on the nights where it really has to be decent because there's been nights where we've played festivals and they're like if you don't hit that and it goes through, you're smashing the headliner's LED wall, which is hung up behind it, and you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna cause a ton of damage, and we cannot afford that. And we're like, right, be really, really good at throwing this thing. <laughs> um, so, like every time it hits and it works, I go yay, and every time it doesn't, like I'm I'm just going fucking start the song <laughs> this is really just start it now because i really need something to get me out of this but yeah it um that's that's the kind of the, the tension that i deal with in that bit <laughs> hard to throw it looks hard to throw yeah it is it is hard to throw it's um because the other thing that you guys probably well you guys definitely don't hear is it's timed so i've got to make sure that my throw is lined up and travels a certain distance, which is different every night within a certain amount of time because it is to a to a click track which goes with the rest of the sonics, which is like the, the sound design over the top of it. Um, so figuring out how you're gonna throw that and not burn your arm 
well, like and the flame is a different size every night depending on how much fuel is on the wick or where where I'm holding it and the fuel might have moved in the bottle and all of those kind of things. Yeah, I end up with throws where I'm like, eh. oh, sorry, <laughs> throws where I'm like that. And yeah, throws where I've, I've literally like had throws where it's like the it's a meter away but I need the throw to take three seconds and it goes Dunk. <laughs> like you'll have to hit it on an angle and stuff and it's a it's a yeah, constant struggle man <laughs> and you gotta try not to just hit Ben straight in the head and yeah. kind of torch his kid that's it yeah <laughs> yeah that's it it's um there's been several nights where like it's like it's hit and bits of the flame have literally just gone straight down on the drum stool and I watch the guys run up and go oh shit put out the drums before the drums are alight, so yeah. <laughs> um, you kind of mentioned in the film, you know, that the the reason that the, the uh, Varken and everything was so important to you is that kind of, you know, that was always seen as kind of the festival headline slots were always kind of, that was that was the dream, mm. you know, that was the aim. Mm. Um, do we have Robert in our audience tonight? Robbo. Hey, you on. <laughs> um, I guess this, you know, what I wanted to ask kind of feeds into what Robert sent in is his question, which is, how you guys keep motivated and those kind of milestones and those ambitions that you still have to hit, you know, having such a big summer last year, hitting those festival mm. headline slots, what, what's the next kind of target and goal in mind? Keep, keep going forwards, basically. Um, for me, it's less about like, those slots are simply representative of the amount of people that you get to play to. And obviously it's representative of someone's faith in you being able to do that for what is their event um and it's not something which you can fake your way into like at the end of the day someone who's putting on a festival um that is a financial endeavor for them they have a brand and they have a passion in the same way that you have for what you do for which is for us being in a band so they have to believe in you to be able to go this like parkway drives name there is worth me putting on in that space because this many people will go i would like to see what they do at that point in time um there's still so much potential for us to grow there and i want to i would love to continue doing that and for me like the goal is less about saying I want to play this festival, this festival, I want this slot, I want this prestige or anything like that. It is, it is just I want to expand the experience that I get on stage playing to people and that moment which you get for the one and a half hours, two hours or whatever, which is like, I don't know, if, if, if I have an, a, any addiction in the world, it is being on stage feeling that, communal spirit which is going on at that point in time because it's i can't even des describe what it's like like I've, I've i watch bands from in the crowd and i know that feeling of being connected to everyone around me and we're all in the same the same moment at the same point in time but the perception of being on stage and your artwork um and something which is res resonates so deeply with you connecting with that many people is it's such a uh, humbling and life affirming feeling that I'd love to be able to just continue growing that and it's nice to feel like it is continually growing like the the growth of the band is not something that kind of just goes up and down or anything like that it does just seem like people genuinely enjoy the experience of being there when we play and at the end of the day that's all we want so to do that more like the next milestone is just continue doing that more <laughs> really that kind of community and shared experience was that one of the motivating factors for wanting to put this film out in the cinema aspect you know one yep. night only same time everyone gets to see this all at once because yeah yeah it would have been easy just to kind of you know put this up online yeah it was a way of combating it. the like the the like that idea of it just being something frivolous as well um, of making it an event in that way um, but also I like the idea the whole idea with everything that we've done with this with the way this is released is to give it the perception and the like change the angle in which it is seen in everyone's eyes 
in the sense of this will be played in a cinema where the other music biopics are, are played, where the other blockbusters are played. It might not be a Hollywood production, but it is art which has been made to the same quality as this. Put it in a cinema. When we make the artwork for the movie poster, we will get it done by the people who made the fucking Star Wars artwork. So it is of an equal thing because we come from a background which is seen as less than. Like heavy music is still sneered at. It's still seen as like that, oh, I can't understand what they're saying. Cringe away from this. They're scary. I've got no idea. It's the caricature. And it's, it's like one of the last caricatures remaining within music. And if we can do something that takes that away um, and that can even make people that don't, like, that aren't engaged in this kind of music go, well, that looks like something interesting. Like, that looks engaging to me because it, it's not presented in a stereotypical form. That's why, like, it's important. Winston, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Viva the Thanks Underdogs man. is in cinemas on Wednesday, January the 22nd. If you've been watching this on Facebook, you'll have seen some ticket links and things to buy there. It's going all around the world. Uh, join in with your fellow Parkway fans. Um, guys, round of applause, please, for Winston. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Cheers. Actually, we'll, we'll end with, with one final question. All right, go for it. You've got Wembley Arena in the diary in April. Yeah. What comes after that? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not really thinking past that at this point in time. That seems that's kind of like the, the this year is especially like Wembley's the only UK show we're doing this year. Um, and what we have planned for it is obviously the next like we don't we don't go backwards. It's an, the next evolution of what we're doing. Um, and beyond that, the next evolution of what we're doing is going to be very interesting and it's going to take time to work on and everything but it's like to be honest it feels like we have a creative gas tank that's completely overflowing um and we have the time and the desire to really fulfill every bit of potential that we hopefully can well that we can see within what we've done so far we consider what we've done have been to have been very dictated by many many circumstances and um we would love the chance to be able to create something that is literally just the 100 percent pure potential of what we can do and it's not limited by time or resources or circumstances or musical ability or anything like that because i feel like we've finally grown to a point where we know our shit and we really want to put that down in a way that is ex expansive and representative of what we love within heavy music and that's kind of the next thing looking forward to it one more time please mr winston mccall thanks for listening